Pam Murray is our guest speaker tonight. Pam has over 27 years experience in the travel industry, working with different insurance companies. And uh, she spent, I think, uh, the last five years with AMA Travel. And uh, I know you've been associated with AMA for, if not all your career, most of it. So Pam's going to answer all our questions about travel insurance for men and our families uh, as we uh, journey in life, not just with cancer, but outside of Alberta. So thank you very much for having us tonight. And, and uh, yes, my name is Pam Murray and 27 years in the travel insurance business. So I have worked for a number of different insurance companies. Um, and like we said, I've been with AMA either as an employee or a supportive person working uh, from an insurance company perspective. I have worked for RBC Travel Insurance. I've worked for Manual Life. I worked for Potter and Smith, which we looked after the Reliable Life product. Um, and I can tell you the best one so far is, of course, my, my job with AMA and with Orion. So happy about that. Okay, anywhere on here, you say? Anywhere maybe there? Just press it down there. You're guessing. No, there, there we go. Okay. So our agenda, we're going we're gonna to talk about this stuff, but we're going to try not to keep you here as long as I normally do. Uh, but we're going to talk about needing travel insurance when you're traveling outside of Canada, as well as within our own country. So we will talk about what is it that Alberta Healthcare covers you for when you're in another province, but we're also going to talk about what Alberta Healthcare doesn't cover you for. So why do you need to look for a travel insurance plan? even when we're still in our own country. I think everybody realizes the importance of having insurance when you leave the country and what the differences are there, but we'll talk about both of those. We're gonna talk about what's covered by a travel insurance policy, but more importantly, we're gonna talk about what's not covered. Because no one ever gets mad at the insurance company when they pay the claim, right? Nobody shows up on Marketplace happy that the insurance company paid the $300,000 claim, but people show up on Marketplace when the claim hasn't been paid, so, and why is that? So we wanna make sure we understand the exclusions part as well. And I've given everybody a copy of our medical questionnaire, our medical declaration, but we'll talk about medical declarations in general. So why is it important to make sure you complete the form accurately and completely? Um, why do they ask some of the questions that are on there? And what does the que medical questionnaire do? Like, why is it in there? Why do they ask the questions and so on? And then we'll talk about what to do in the event of an emergency, and then especially when you're making a claim. So what's the process? Um, do the insurance companies pay up front? Do you have to prepay that stuff? We'll, we'll talk about those things. And then at the end, we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about cancellation insurance. So why is it important when you're booking your cruises and your tours and all that? The travel agent says you need to have cancellation insurance. What exactly is that stuff and why do you need to have that? And then, of course, we'll have time for questions at the end. So AMA um, has started to deal with Orion Travel Insurance probably about five years ago. And one of the biggest benefits for this insurance company is the fact that it's owned by the association, so by CAA. And when I look at all of the different insurance companies that I've worked for in the past, the one thing that's better about this company is the fact that it is focused on the membership. That doesn't mean that if you're an AMA member that you're, we're just going to pay your claim regardless of what happens. There is still a policy and there's still terms and conditions. But when that policy is put together by the association, it is put together with the member in mind. Because let's face it, without the membership, the CAA organization as a national organization is nothing. It's only about the members. So that to us is the most important thing. Thing. When we talk about travel insurance companies and that they have a primary network, when a client gets sick at destination and contacts the assistance company, the first thing they're going to do is find out where you are, if you're safe, what's the issue, and where's the closest facility or the best facility that needs to look after your specific situation. So if it's something that's more minor, then chances are you'll be directed to an outpatient clinic of sorts. If it's an urgent emergency situation, then we're sending the ambulance and we're sending you off to the, to the closest facility. 
When we look at the number of people that travel to the U.S. especially, um, about 80% of our AMA clientele travels to the U.S. So all of our rates need to be based on the U.S. dollar and the U.S. healthcare system. So when we look at these um, networks, we're, what we're doing is with these networks, we have got an agreement with them to say, if we send our people to you, we've gone to audit the facility. So we're not sending them to Joe's House of Surgery. We're sending them to qualified, reputable places to get looked after. But what we do is we'll say, if we're going to send our people to you, what kind of rate are you going to give us in return? We'll pay the claim quickly. But instead of, let's say, on average, the cost of emergency care in the U.S. can be anywhere between $3,000 and $5,000 a day. We may have, through these networks, we may have a negotiated rate of, let's say, something like $1,000 a day. So you can see right away that that reduction in that price that the client is, having, is, is being charged is going to come back to the client as far as lower premiums, and we're going to be able to send our clients confidently there because we've also made sure that they're a reputable situation. So instead of $3,000 or $5,000 a day, if we're paying $1,000 for that treatment, again, that helps the bottom line and that gets passed down to our members and our customers. So when we look at probably 95% of our U.S. clients go through this uh, process with our preferred partners, you can see that's going to make a large difference in in the cost that's going to be associated with that. It doesn't mean that if you are in an area where there isn't a preferred network there, you still have coverage. We're still going to look after you. We're still going to pay the bills, whatever it is. What we do is we concentrate on those large areas where, let's say, the snowbirds are traveling or there's high frequency of Canadians going to those areas. We want to make sure that that population is being looked after. But if you're in the middle of Montana somewhere and you're in a car accident, the insurance policy is still going to pay up front for that um, treatment and whatnot. We're just going to have to contact the billing department of the hospital in Billings, Montana, instead of it already being set up like it would be in Yuma and Phoenix and Tucson and, and so on. So that's what we look at here. But I think the thing for us is the fact that it is owned by the association. When we look at what Alberta Healthcare covers, when you're traveling within Canada, Alberta Healthcare travels with you. So it's going to cover you for the same services in another province that they cover for here. So hospital bed, doctor's bills, x-ray, surgeries, all of that. What they don't cover for in Alberta, they're not going to cover for in another province. So those are the things that we're going to talk about in a minute as to why you need to have coverage here. But when we look at the things they cover for, regardless of the difference in cost, they're going to pay for the service. So let's say it is the hospital bed here is $1,000, but in BC it's $1,500. Alberta Healthcare is still going to pay the $1,500 in BC because they pay for the hospital bed. So it's a still the same service. Now, all of the provinces, with the exception of Quebec, are part of the Canada Health Act, so therefore part of the reciprocal billing agreement. What that means is, when I go to visit my dad in Manitoba, if I get sick, I show up at the clinic and I show them my Alberta health care card. And I don't pay anything. They look after me, I see the doctor, everything's great. If I get sick while I'm in Quebec and I go to the clinic there, they'd rather see my visa card than see my Alberta health care card. So I would need to pay for that bill, bring it back, and then submit that bill to Alberta health care for reimbursement. Now, does anybody know how long it takes Alberta Healthcare to reimburse a bill? Six months, right? Yeah. So it's anywhere, on average throughout the year, is between 20 and 24 weeks. So what that means to you, and the thing you need to watch out for when you're looking for any travel insurance plan, is you want to find out, do they prepay the bill for you, or is it reimbursement only? If it's reimbursement, what that means is you need to take the bill that you get from the hospital, you need to send it to Alberta Healthcare, you'll wait the six months for that to come back to you, and then you'll submit it to your provider for reimbursement. So you need to be prepared that that bill could take seven, eight months to be reimbursed to you. How the AMA plan works, you get sick at destination, 
you give us a call. We're going to send you some claim forms because everybody needs to fill out claim forms. You're going to give us your Alberta health care number and whatever other insurance you might have. We're going to take the bill from you. We'll send it to Alberta Health Care. You've signed over your rights to whatever Alberta Health Care is going to reimburse. And you're going to say, it's OK for AMA to take that. And in the meantime, we'll pay the bill. So you have nothing to do other than fill out the claim form and then get healthy. You don't have to worry about all the paperwork that comes and goes in that next six months while we're waiting for Alberta Health Care to reimburse. So when you're looking at insurance policies and how much you're paying for your coverage, you want to make sure you understand how does their claim service work? Because that could get you into a paperwork nightmare of months and months and months of waiting for Alberta Health Care to reimburse you. So something to watch out for. When we talk about travel outside of Canada, Alberta Health Care has a set schedule of how much they pay. Simply $100 a day Canadian for the hospital bed and $50 Canadian for the outpatient care. So when I said earlier that the emergency cost could be anywhere between $3,000 and $5,000 a day, Alberta Healthcare is going to donate $100 to the cause, and you're buying travel insurance to cover that difference between that $100 they pay and what the actual cost is. So I know I don't need to explain why you need to have coverage outside the country. I do want to just talk about traveling in Canada and the things that are not covered by Alberta Healthcare. So things like ambulance, air ambulance, um, family being flown to your bedside. If clients need to uh, have driven on their vacation and now you're sick and you need to be flown home, somebody needs to bring your vehicle back, whether it's your car, your truck and fifth wheel, your motor home, your motorcycle, your travel insurance policy will look after the expense to bring that vehicle back. So those are all things not covered by Alberta Healthcare, but covered by a travel insurance policy. It's never a happy topic, but we do need to talk about people passing away while they're on vacation. So the cost to prepare and ship the body home or the cost to have the body uh, cremated at destination is not a benefit of Alberta health care, so does need to be covered, and you would do that with a travel insurance policy. An air ambulance from the East Coast could easily cost you $45,000 to get you home. And that's something that is not covered by Alberta Health Care at all. So important to know that. One of the things that we talk about with our uh, traveling in Canada benefit is the fact that we have a plan at AMA for people who are traveling strictly in Canada. So if there's a chance where we have some of our members who may get to an age where they don't feel comfortable leaving the country anymore, it could be the cost of the insurance is prohibiting them from going. Um, south any longer. So instead of thinking that they can't travel anywhere and they've got to stay home for the rest of their life, there is opportunity for them to travel within our own country. So maybe you don't get to go to Phoenix for the winter, but you could go to Victoria for a month. It's, chances are it's going to be warmer there than it is here. So there is a travel in Canada plan that allows the clients to travel without a medical questionnaire being required and no pre-existing exclusion because again, Alberta Healthcare is covering for the majority of that expense. So we'll still be there to cover for the air ambulance and the family to be flown there, all of those types of things. So if you know anybody that's in that situation, make sure that they give us a call to sort of talk about what are their options for coverage to still travel somewhere within Canada. When we talk about understanding travel insurance as it is, the thing to remember about this is the fact that it is always about emergency situations. This is not to cover ongoing routine care that you need here at home. This is all about the unexpected uh, emergency expenses at destination. So when we talk about what that means, treatment that's medically necessary, so it has to be appropriate for the situation. I always like to use the example of, let's say I'm riding my bicycle and I fall off my bike and I hurt my toe. I need to go to the doctor, I need to go to a clinic and get my toe looked at. It probably needs an x-ray, taped up, maybe some meds and send me on my way. I don't need to have an MRI on my toe. 
especially when we're traveling in the US, we know that it is private enterprise and these people are there to make money. So they would be happy to run all kinds of tests on me to find out what else is wrong with me as opposed to just looking after fixing my toe, right? And so what we want to do, whenever a travel insurance company is asking you to contact them as soon as you need them or before you seek treatment, it's not just that they're being nosy. They want to make sure that, first of all, you're going to a reputable place to get looked after. Secondly, they want to make sure that the, the facility, whether it's a clinic or an emergency room or whatever, isn't doing tests or treatments on you that isn't related to the situation at hand. And I, I mean, over 27 years, I tell you all kinds of stories about people coming back where the doctor, they went in because they were feeling congested, and the doctor said, well, you need a pacemaker or you need triple bypass. And they've never had a heart problem in their life. So thankfully, most times they're like, mm, I think I'll just go home, got home, went to see their cardiologist, and yeah, there was no need for triple bypass or no need for a pacemaker. So these things happen, and that's the scary thing. So it has to be appropriate for the situation. It's not experimental treatment. It can't be omitted without you know, further damage to their condition. Um, it can't be delayed until you get home. And then, of course, it's delivered in the most cost-effective manner. When we talk about this, especially in the US, being private enterprise, you want to have somebody advocating for you that knows what the reasonable costs should be for that, and they're going to fight for you on that as well. You're not going to walk in and all of a sudden just hand over your visa card and, and they're like, you know, cha-ching, cha-ching, and off they go. And lots of times when people will walk into an emergency room, the doctor or the admitting staff, the billing department really, will take the credit card and there'll be $25,000 on there and then off you go see what's wrong, right? <laughs> you haven't even asked me what the problems are and now you've got this, you know, stuck in there. One of the most important things um, for a travel insurance policy is when we get to a certain age, there's, you know, we got something going on, right? So most travel insurance policies will have a discussion related to their pre-existing conditions. When AMA put together this policy with Orion, the thing that was most important to them is to make sure that we could cover our members and customers for their existing conditions. So what we said was, we're prepared to cover those ex emergency expenses related to the condition as long as it's been stable for a particular period of time. So to us, that stable time period is strictly based on your age. So 69 years of age and younger, it's a three-month time period prior to the departure date. For 70 plus, then it's six months prior to the departure date. So not prior to when you buy the policy, it's prior to when you leave on that trip. So if in fact you have a claim at destination, we're gonna look and say, okay, you left on January 1st, we're gonna ask for the three month or six month time period prior to January 1st and see, was your condition stable? So to us, what stable means is there's no change in your medications or no change in your treatments. So a change in medication does mean an increase or decrease in the dosage, means adding in a new medication or taking away a medication. Lots of times people will say, my doctor reduced my medication or took me off it because I'm doing so good. And that's lovely. From the insurance company's perspective, they just want you on that lowered medication or they want you on that dosage for that three month or six month period, right? So, because lots of times reducing the medication or taking it away can throw your condition out of whack, right? So they're just wanting everything to be the same for that time period. It also means no hospitalization, no new symptoms. It means that you're not waiting for any test results or waiting to see a specialist for that condition. We are not excluding a person because they are unstable. We might exclude the condition that's not been stable. So if I were going to travel with an unstable heart condition, and while I'm at destination, I fall and break my leg, my broken leg is still gonna be covered. It's anything related to my heart that's not gonna be covered. Now, in a few slides here, I'm gonna show you some average costs of things. So if you've got an unstable heart condition, I'm gonna suggest you stay at home, right? <laughs> Just saying. If you got an unstable thyroid condition, what the cost of an emergency thyroid thing 
is not going to break the bank and it's, you're not going to lose your house over that. So you may choose to travel with an unstable thyroid. I'm not going to suggest you travel with an unstable heart condition. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Most travel insurance companies will list their pre-existing conditions one of two ways. On the left hand side is how the AMA policy is listed. So it says no coverage is going to be provided for any medical condition that was not stable in the three months or whatever term, so for us is three or six, prior to the departure date. Now some insurance policies will list it like it is on the right hand side where it says no coverage is going to be provided for any sickness or injury where you experience symptoms, you were diagnosed, you were treated, you required hospitalization, or you took medication during the three months or whatever term prior to your departure date. So these two things are very different. I always like to use my dad as an example. So 83 years of age, 84 on Saturday, so 83 years of age, had a heart attack 23 years ago, angioplasty at the time, he takes one heart pill a day, one high blood pressure pill a day. I don't think his heart pill has changed for 10 years and I don't think his blood pressure pill has changed for 20 years. But every day, one heart pill, one high blood pressure. Now if he has our coverage, like on the left hand side, and heaven forbid has a heart attack while he's away, our policy is going to cover him because for his age, he needs to be stable for six months. Well, he's been stable for over a decade. Right? So if he had a heart attack, it would be covered. Now, if he has a policy like listed on the right hand side, and again, heaven forbid, but had a heart attack while he's away, is that policy going to cover him for his heart attack? No, because it says no coverage is going to be provided for any sickness if you took medication in the three months or six months prior to departure. So what the one on the right hand side says is basically if you're popping a pill for that problem, then that problem's off the table. They're not going to cover you for it. So when you're looking for travel insurance, the one on the right hand side should be less expensive than the one on the left because the one on the right is not covering you for anything that you're taking medication or having any treatment for. So it is really just a accident injuries or brand new conditions. So you need to be really careful when you're, research, uh, when you're researching travel insurance, price isn't the only thing you want to look at. So make sure if you look at nothing else, make sure you ask them how do they look at pre-existing conditions and the expenses related. When we look at the benefits of a travel insurance policy, so hospital and doctor's expenses, the return of vehicle like I talked about, the family expense to travel to your bedside. So if you're at destination and something happens to you and you're hospitalized there and the doctor there is saying, hey, you know, somebody should be at your bedside to help make decisions and help you to recover, your travel insurance policy is going to pay for that person to fly to your bedside, fly home again, cover their hotels, their meals, their phone calls, their taxi fares while they're there, plus your travel insurance policy, well ours does, and most of them will, will cover that person for medical insurance as well while they're there. So if they got sick or if they broke their leg, they'd have coverage. Because usually when that situation happens, people hop on the next plane and off they go. They don't stop and think, oh geez, I better go buy medical insurance, right? They're just worried dad's in the hospital or mom's in the hospital and away they go. So it's important to know that we're there looking after all of that stuff. We talked about the return of deceased. The one thing about the return of deceased, when you're looking at policies and you're comparing products, you want to find out if in fact there's a limit that's attached to that benefit. So people will always say, there's a million dollars coverage or there's two million dollars coverage with my plan, but is there a limitation for the cost to return the body? So a lot of times customer policies will have maybe a $5,000 or a $10,000 cap to return the body. Well, that's barely going to get my body home from Edmonton to Calgary. So if you're traveling, say, to Arizona, California, Texas kind of distance, we see those claims for the return of the remains to be in at least the $25,000 range. During that shooting in uh, Vegas, so one of the Canadians that was, in, was, was um, killed was from Valley View. So they shipped the body home. Um, 
And now because of the situation, because of the number of people that were involved there, they needed to do an autopsy on it. They had to keep the body there longer. They had to embalm the body before they could do the autopsy because of the time delay. And of course, once they embalm the body, then there's no cremation available. So then the body had to be shipped back as it was to the tune of $58,000 by the time it was all of the preparation was done and so on. And that person had no coverage. They were young, they were going, there was no problem. What would they need coverage for? So it doesn't matter the age of the traveler. <laughs> Everybody needs to have travel insurance. So it's never a happy topic, but what you don't want to have happen is leaving a big bill for your estate or for your family to look at. Can after. I get you to go back to the previous slide? Sure. If I can. Uh, yeah. The right side. Yeah. All right. First of all, the left side is, I think, is pretty clear. If you're stable, and your 84-year-old father, yeah. and he has an incident down there, he would be covered. Right. On the right side, you say sickness or injury, which yeah. experiences symptoms or dynamics were, were treated. So, are we saying this is unknown, or are we saying it's uh, you were taking medication for something that might have been temporary? Yeah, you could be taking, so let's say I sprained my ankle a month before I traveled. And that's an injury prior to going, and I was on medication for it, and still on medication for it, and I re-injure it or it complicates later on, I'm not covered for that. I'm not covered for that on either side of them because it's not been stable. It is, it is not what we would call something that is permanent with your health condition. It was a temporary thing that happened to you. It could be a, a temporary thing as well. It could be like my father who's been on the meds for 20 years. Yeah, it could be either way. So, if, okay, he sprains his ankle. Would he be denied coverage because uh, of the, he has been on heart medication for 20 years? No. He wouldn't be? No. If he get the coverage? That's right. All right, that's all it is. We're only looking at, uh, from our perspective, we may exclude a condition that hasn't been stable Right? We're not going to exclude him from coverage, but we're going to exclude his heart if his heart hasn't been stable on our coverage. On the one on the right, they're going to exclude any condition where they're taking medication, whether they've been taking it for 10 years or 20 years or two months. But they're not related. The left side is take medication for some, uh, an ongoing permanent condition, right? He's taken a pill twice a day. Yeah. Uh, two pills twice a day for the last 20 years. Yeah. So he would be considered stable. stable. But if he sprains his ankle. It's not related to his heart? Well, we would understand that that coverage would have to be paid for. Right. But that wouldn't affect his heart condition. No. Uh, no. Uh, no. It just, it's looking at the condition that's not been stable, not looking at the other. Okay? That helps? Okay. Now, when we talk about emergency dental, one thing you want to look at there, it's most travel insurance companies always talk about uh, permanent, er, like natural teeth or permanently attached artificial teeth. Most travel insurance companies aren't going to cover your dentures or your partial plates that are removable, anything like that. You also want to know that if you're going to go and have some dental treatment done in Mexico while you're south for the winter, you're choosing to have that done, so no travel insurance company is going to pay for that. Whether it is uh, you know, done in Mexico or then you come back into the U.S. and now you have a complication to the stuff that was done in Mexico, all of that's related to what you chose to have done. They're not going to cover for that, so just be aware bump up your budget to cover for any complications that might arise. When we look at air ambulance expenses on a, tram, on a medical policy or travel policy, the other thing you want to look at for your plans when you are comparing is you want to make sure there is no limit on the air ambulance expense. So lots of companies, again, may impose a $10,000 or $20,000 cap on the cost of an air ambulance. So the other thing with air ambulance is you want to find out, are they going to prepay that air ambulance for you? So how the AMA policy is worded is that we will guarantee the payment and prepay that air ambulance for you. You're not going to have to do it. Uh, we'll do it in advance. And the thing you need to know is air ambulance companies are not going to pick you up and take you home until the bill is paid. 
So if you're in a foreign hospital waiting to get out of there and it's $100,000 to get you home from Croatia, you need to pay the $100,000. So you wanna make sure you've got an insurance company that's gonna pay that for you, right? Because again, if you're looking at having that reimbursement and having that money out for a length of time, you're gonna to have to sort of come up with that, you know, whether you have to take it from somewhere. So it's important to make sure you've got that. If you've got a plan that has a $20,000 cap, and your cost to get home is 100,000, they'll give you the 20,000, but you still need to come up with the 100 to get, to get you out of there, to get your loved one out of there. So watch for those kinds of things. When a travel insurance policy talks about evacuation insurance, you wanna, what that's all about, it's not an air ambulance, this is non-medical air uh, evacuation. So this is to get you out of a situation. So let's say we're wintering on a nice island in the South Pacific. Now there's been a, uh, an earthquake, now there's a tsunami coming and you need to get out of there. This is a $5,000 benefit to get you off that island or off the side of the mountain, wherever you are in trouble, to somewhere safe. This is not getting you all the way home, it's getting you from that problem area to somewhere safe. This is not about getting you out if the Canadian government says Canadians need to get out of there because of, you know, whether it's a terrorist activity or it's a hurricane's coming or that kind of thing. That's covered under interruption insurance and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, child care concerns, so if you're traveling with dependent children or dependent grandchildren, if you're injured and hospitalized, somebody needs to look after the kids. So the insurance policy will hire a bonded agency to look after them while you're recovering. It might mean sending them home to somebody there. It might mean bringing somebody down to look after them while they're there. It's usually a stopgap situation until something can be uh, looked after for them. People travel with their pets these days, so if you're being flown home by air ambulance, they're not putting Fifi and Fluffy in the air ambulance with you. So you're coming home there, we're, the travel insurance policy is gonna look after flying your domestic dog, domestic cat, or your service dog home. So if you're traveling with some sort of weirdo pet, then you're on your own. So we're not flying your boa constrictor home, we're not flying your pot belly pig home, right? And your service, your service animal is a service dog, right? So if you got a service chicken or a service whatever, again, you're on your own for that. And the number of people that talk about having like a bird, like a cockatoo or whatever as their service pet. No chickens. It's not that I don't like chicken. I quite enjoy chicken on my plate, yeah. I'm not, I'm not traveling with the chicken. Um, there's usually coverage in here for vision and for hearing aids, so if you damage your glasses or lose them, damage, or they're stolen while you're at a destination, or same thing with your hearing aids, there is coverage to replace them at destination. Don't get excited, it's $300 for your glasses and $200 for your hearing aids. So it's not going to be a huge amount for that. But you know what would happen if it was an unlimited amount, right? It'd be like everybody lost their glasses and everybody needs new hearing aids. So I'd rather we had an unlimited amount for things like the air ambulance and for the, um, the return of the deceased. We can all buy our own glasses and, and whatnot. So that kind of gives you an idea of what the benefits are um, under travel insurance policy. So for the things that are covered, we need to talk about the things that are not covered. So when we look at the number of, um, or the claims that are denied, and one of the things that I'm really proud of with this, with this association with Orion and AMA is the fact that we have a very low denial rate. Our denial rate is usually between a half a percent and one percent of the claims submitted are denied. Most travel insurance companies operate with a five to six percent denial rate. So there's a couple reasons why ours is low. Partly it's our medical questionnaires easier to answer so people aren't making mistakes on there and being denied because they answered incorrectly. Um, we're, our staff is able to have the discussion with you ahead of time so that you understand what's gonna be covered and what's not gonna be covered. Um, the policy is laid out in an easy manner so that you can understand what that is. But we still do have denied claims. So the number one reason for why claims are denied with us is because people are traveling with an unstable pre-existing. So to give you an example, gentleman went uh, on a trip, was going for 60 days, left October 9th, 72 years of age. 
So six weeks into his vacation, he was, he was having trouble breathing, called the ambulance, off he went to the hospital. So he was in the hospital, they ran a number of tests, the prognosis was not good, he was sent home by air ambulance, bill was around $120,000 when it was all said and done. So because he's 72 years of age, left on, what did I say, October 9th? November 9th, well, whenever it was, October, it was the 9th of the month, so let's say it was October 9th he left. So what we do is we look at six months prior to his departure on October 9th. So we don't count 182 or 183 days. We say, you left October 9th, so we go back September, August, July, June, May, April. And so we say, okay, from April 9th till October 9th, what was going on with his medical condition? So in that six month time period, he had been to the doctor five times. First time was because he couldn't breathe, so he got some medication. Second time he went back for follow-up, more medication, it hadn't helped, so changed the medication there. Third time he went to the doctor, diagnosed with pneumonia. Fourth time he went to the doctor, I can't remember what they did, but the fifth time he went to the doctor was two days before he left on his trip, and the doctor said to him, I don't know what's going on here, we're gonna need to get you in to see a specialist when you get back. Done, right? He's not stable, so because the claim at destination was all related to his breathing issues, not covered, right? Had he had a heart attack, would have been covered. Had he fallen and broken his hip, covered. It's all because it was related to his lungs and his breathing issues, not covered. So this is where I say that if you're traveling with an unstable heart condition, lung condition, your kidneys are not stable, any of the internal organs are not working properly and whatnot, that can lead to a very expensive medical claim in the US. And you wanna make sure that you're aware of that before you go because you're gonna be the one paying the bill. So watch out for that. We also look at known situations prior to travel. So if I had a bad knee and I chose to travel with the bad knee because I know my doctor has said we're gonna need to do a knee replacement, I'm on the list and whatnot, but I go about my normal life. And if I travel with my bad knee and I'm away and it just deteriorates and collapse and I collapse and there's a problem, I'm not covered for that because I always knew I had a bad knee that was going to deteriorate. If of course I got my bad knee and I'm traveling and I'm hit by a car, the emergency expenses related to the damage done by the vehicle accident is going to be covered. So that might mean a couple of stitches and some band-aids and send me on my way, I'd be covered. If the, ex the emergency related to the car accident, let's say it was so bad that it wiped out my knee completely, whether I had a good knee or a bad knee, the damage to the leg was from the car accident, then maybe the emergency expense for the knee replacement, because that was what was required from an emergency standpoint, that would be covered. But please note that if you got a bad knee and you're waiting for a knee replacement, please don't go hoping that you'll get into a fender bender and get a new knee while you're away, because you could end up on the side of the band-aids and a couple of stitches and away you go, okay? So just be careful there. Travel insurance is always attached to the government health plans. So if you don't have a valid Canadian health coverage, then instead of $5 million like our policy covers, you'd be down to $25,000 coverage. And that's not enough for a broken leg. So you need to make sure that you've got valid Canadian health coverage. We don't pay Alberta health care premiums anymore. Everybody's just covered. So the only time this really comes up anymore is if we've got clients who are moving from one province to another. So let's say they've moved here from BC. They need to switch their BC health care over here. And they've got three months in which to do that. If they don't do that or they choose not to do that, and then BC cuts them off, so now here they are in no man's land without any coverage, and they travel, and they have a claim while they're away, that's where they're stuck with $25,000 and not $5 million. So be aware. If you know anybody who's moved provinces, it's always a good reminder to say, hey, have you checked and changed over your health care? And our registries department can help you with that. We do have an abuse of alcohol or drugs or toxic substances exclusion, like every travel insurance policy does. So if the medical expense is related to an alcohol-related sickness or injury, not covered. We don't have a limit on there that says if you're over 0.08, you're not covered. 
because somebody could be over 0.08 because they had an extra glass of wine at dinner. And on the way out the door of the restaurant, they chipped, tripped on the carpet and they fell over and sprained their ankle. They could have tripped on the carpet stone cold sober. So it wasn't the alcohol that caused them the trip, it was the carpet. We're gonna cover that expense. Now, if I'm hammered dancing on the tables and fall off and break my hip, I'm not covered for that because that would clearly, hopefully I don't do that on a regular basis, <laughs> that would, chances are, it was an alcohol-induced thing. The other thing where we've seen a couple, of, um, a couple of claims denied over the last couple of years is a client who's been taken into the hospital with emergency situation and it was deemed to be related to chronic alcoholism, so it could be, you know, cirrhosis of the liver diagnosed at that point or whatever from the chronic alcoholism. That's an alcohol-related sickness or injury, so that's not covered either. I mean, every year there's usually, and usually it's a young person, who thinks that they can jump from the balcony of their uh, hotel room into the pool, right, and they don't quite make it, and so now they've got a broken back, a broken leg, a broken neck, whatever, and now they want that covered. Well, most people don't do that sober. So there's usually an alcohol or drug component in there. If it's non-compliance with medical therapy, this is one that I want you to pay attention to in the sense that if your doctor prescribes a medication or a treatment for you and you choose not to do it, an insurance policy in you and you had a claim related to that condition at destination, the insurance policy can look at that and say, you didn't follow your doctor's orders, we're not paying for that. So if you don't agree with the prescription as it's related as the doctor has given to you, then go back to your doctor and talk to them about that and get that off your, your record. Because the insurance company would have access to your records and if it shows it on there and you're not taking it, you're not gonna be covered. So be careful with that. Um, some of these other ones, you want to make sure that you know if you are traveling or while you're traveling you want to do a particular activity, make sure that your travel insurance policy is going to cover you for that activity. So you want to make sure that you're covered if you want to go hiking or mountain climbing or rock climbing, those kinds of things. What we exclude, we exclude if you want to be a pilot, passenger or crew of any aircraft. So to us, an aircraft is anything that's chiefly supported by its buoyancy in air. Now, we're not talking about commercial jets and whatnot, but we're talking about private planes. If you're flying an, an ultralight, uh, if, you're flying, if you are um, hang gliding or parasailing or parachuting or as, um, kite surfing, skydiving, all that kind of stuff. If there's a little piece of nylon that's keeping you up there, we are not covering you when you come crashing down, okay? But what we will cover you for, you can go scuba diving and snorkeling and kayaking and canoeing and zip lining and bungee jumping and hiking and trekking and mountain climbing and rock climbing and, and so on. And you're covered for that, okay? We're not gonna cover any participation as a professional in sport. So to us, professional is your main paid occupation. So you can go into a golf tournament while you're down there and win 100 bucks. If your buddy hits you in the head with their golf club accidentally, then that's covered for you because it's not your main paid occupation. We don't cover any um, race or speed contests. So if you're gonna go down and now you're gonna race around the track, uh, you know, in a Daytona, thing where it is where, where it is a timed event and a race then you're not covered for that okay now the one thing too that we always like to talk about I know this isn't the pregnancy and childbirth crowd or chances are it's it could be but but it's likely not so for your daughters or granddaughters if they're talking about traveling when they're pregnant, please let them know that insurance companies will only cover them in the first 31 or 30 weeks of their pregnancy and cover them for complications. If the baby's born at destination, the baby's never covered. So that's where you could end up with a half million, three quarters of a million, million dollar baby expense. Because if she goes into labor and delivers that baby at 28 weeks, that's a complication for her, but that baby is out, and as soon as the baby is out and on its own, all of those neonatal expenses are attached to the baby. And the baby's not on the policy. You can't buy a policy for an unborn child, 
somebody's paying for that and it's not going to be the insurance company. So if they're at the point in the pregnancy where the child would survive, they really should stay home. So save your own bank accounts because you know they don't have any money and they're going to come and looking for help from you. So tell them to stay at home. They want to go on a baby moon, right? They want to go on a trip before the baby comes. Tell them to go to Banff, right? It's lovely there any time of year. When we have the, um, some average costs of the emergencies, so again, you can have a run-of-the-mill heart attack for, for $75,000, or you could have a $350,000 heart attack. It all depends on where you are, how, how uh, bad was the situation, how long are you in the hospital for, did you need surgery, did you get flown home, you know, all of that stuff um, calculates into what the actual costs are. I put the flu turned into pneumonia on here because it might be that you're not feeling great and you think, eh, I'll get better. I'm not worried about it. You don't go get treatment and now it's pneumonia. Now you're hospitalized, you're in there for two weeks and voila, it's at $80,000. So it's important to make sure you go and get checked out. One of the new things coming up with our policy is this ability to, it's called, um, Do, it's not, it's kind of like Dr. Phil's Doctor on Demand, if you ever watch Dr. Phil. Um, but it's a, it's a web-based program where you can contact a doctor, talk about your symptoms, whether it's over FaceTime, you know, so then the doctor can say to you, eh, that's an over-the-counter cream you need, or, oh, no, you should go to the emergency room, or, oh, uh, you know, you can go to the clinic, and this is what they'll look after. And if it's serious enough, they'll be like, we're sending the ambulance to you right away. Because lots of times people go to a clinic, and they sit there for hours, and chances are you're going to get sicker because you're sitting there with all the sick people than really what needs to be done. So it's a great thing to make sure that you could get quick service and quick advice before you end up going anywhere else. So it's a great, it's going to be a great service when we uh, roll it out. When we talked about the average cost for air ambulance, this is where if you've got a plan that has a limitation on the air ambulance of $5,000 or $10,000, you need to know what the cost could be. And again, these are averages to give you an idea. So if you're going to Arizona, it's going to be in the $25,000 to $30,000 range. If you're going to Hawaii, it's going to be $60,000 to $70,000, $80,000 on average. And if you're going to Thailand, look the heck out. You're talking $215,000 and up. So it is a crazy amount. When we talk about completing medical questionnaires, I can't stress enough how important it is to make sure you answer the questions accurately. We are not asking for your opinion of whether or not you think it's necessary to tell us the answer. We are asking the questions of yes or no. So lots of times people will say to me, yeah, I'm on that medication, but really, it's no big deal. That's not what the question's asking. The question is asking, in the last 12 months, have you had any treatment or medication for your heart condition? Yes or no? Not, yeah, but it's one little white pill, and what's the big deal? I don't know if I take it all the time, blah, blah, blah. That's a yes. Okay, so make sure you're reading the question clearly and make sure you're asking the question of the person who's selling you the product to make sure that you understand what the question is asking. If there's any sort of confusion at all, please don't continue on. Make sure you're understanding that. Because what can happen to you if there is a wrong answer on the questionnaire? It could be, like our policy, is we have sort of twofold. We understand that there could be an honest mistake versus it being a blatant non-disclosure and like I like to call you a big fat liar, right? So an honest mistake could be that someone's taking a pill because they had a sore leg, right? The doctor told them there's a little hardening of the arteries. Never once saying you have peripheral vascular disease, right? So when the question comes up on the questionnaire and the client's looking, they think, well, I can't possibly have that. I've never heard that term before. So they say no. They have a claim. We get their medical history. And now we see 10 milligrams of blah, blah, blah for PVD. And the client has said no to that. So in discussion with the client, they'll say, well, he told me I went because I had a sore leg, told me I had some hardening in the arteries, take this pill. And that's it. Is it fair to blame the client because the doctor didn't really fully explain what the term was that they had? So what Orion does in that circumstance is, after discussion with them, we'll look and see, is there a difference in the premium that's paid? 
um, and what they should have paid for that right answer. So we'll charge the additional premium, and they may have to pay a five thousand, the first five thousand dollars of that claim as a penalty of sorts, right? If it was a situation where the client blatantly did not disclose their condition, then the policy is void, and we're not paying anything. Lots of insurance companies will have, that's their only out, is that if there's anything wrong on the questions, the whole thing is void and there's no discussion. So you wanna know before you answer that questionnaire what's gonna happen if you make a mistake and understand what that could be. If you just choose not to find out the answer before you fill out the question, you know that you don't really know, it's your responsibility to call and ask your doctor, right? Don't expect the insurance company is just gonna say, ah, I understand you were busy, you didn't wanna call them, couldn't get the answer. You blatantly answered a question incorrectly without knowing, so it's not gonna be covered. So please, please, please be careful there. These questionnaires, for us, does one thing. It covers um, what the actual cost, it, it determines what the rate is that you're gonna pay for the insurance. The other, in some other insurance companies, they might have the questions, how you answer the questions might determine both the rate and the time period of what your pre-existing condition could be, right? So you want to know that when you're shopping around and looking at things. So for us, and your pre-existing is always there, regardless of how you answer the question. So we can again use my dad as an example. So he'll answer the questionnaire with yes to angioplasty, yes to heart condition, and yes to high blood pressure, and he'll pay rate five as an example. So he'll pay X amount of dollars. Now you get another 83-year-old who had a heart attack three months ago, had angioplasty and is on heart, one heart pill and one high blood pressure pill now, he's gonna pay the same rate. My dad's been stable for a decade, this guy hasn't been stable for three months. So if he goes away traveling and has a heart attack, his heart condition's not going to be covered because he hasn't met that stable time frame, right? So it's two-sided always in there. The pre-existing is always probably the most important thing. If you don't know the answers to the question, like I said, please don't guess. It could result in financial disaster. You want to consult your physician on there. And again, you don't overthink the questions. They are just simple yes and no answers. We're not looking for an essay response on the questionnaire. It's have you had medication or treatment for cancer, yes or no? And then it's gonna ask three questions for the cancer. Have you been um, had treatment, so surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy in the last zero to six months? in the last seven to 12 months, in the last 13, to five, 13 months to five years. So all those things are doing is determining what's the rate you're gonna pay. If you've had treatment or on medication, actively treating the cancer, in the last zero to six months, that's gonna send you to underwriting. So what underwriting is gonna do is then ask some more specific questions for you about your situation. And then they're going to determine different things. How long are you wanting to travel for? And they'll ask you, what's your height? What's your weight? Where are you traveling? What are your other conditions? And they'll determine, are we prepared to cover you for that? If it's been between seven months and 12 months, then it's just a higher rate. If it's been over 12 months, but it hasn't been five years yet, then the rate is a little bit higher than the basic rate. And then once you're past five years, then you're on um, back to the, the base rate, rate one. We've got six rates is what I'm saying. So rate one is the lowest, rate six is the highest, and then underwriting is separate from that. So that's what our form does. Now, um, when we talk about during an emergency, always it's important to call 911 if it's something like a heart attack, a car accident, those kinds of things. Um, and the assistance company is gonna direct you to the closest facility whatever's required, whether it's a clinic, whether it's the emergency department and so on. You're always gonna have a wallet card when you buy an insurance policy that's gonna have those emergency numbers on there. The one thing you wanna know about making a claim with us or with any insurance company is whoever you call first is going to be the insurance company that takes control. So if you have multiple coverages, you might have a retiree plan, you might have purchased an additional coverage somewhere, you might have some coverage on your credit card. Whoever you call first 
looks after the claim. So you want to make sure, if you've got multiple coverages, you want to make sure that you call the one that's got the best service. So if we have, to give you an example, is always the easiest way to explain. We had a client who had Saskatchewan Blue Cross as their employee plan. They had Alberta Healthcare, because they were an Alberta resident. And then they bought, they were going to Cuba for two weeks, and they bought a package policy with their travel arrangements that had cancellation, medical baggage, and accident as well. So he's in Cuba, he's injured, he now needs an air ambulance home. He calls his employee benefits plan, which is Saskatchewan Blue Cross, who has a $5,000 cap on the air ambulance and who doesn't pay until after Alberta Healthcare assesses the bill. So because he called them first, we can't jump in and say, oh no, hey, we'll fly you home, because he's called them. So we just have to sit in the, in the wings and wait for Saskatchewan Blue Cross to get to there, do all of their stuff, and then they'll come to us to coordinate. Had he called us first, we would have prepaid the air ambulance, we would have paid his bills, send his stuff to Alberta Healthcare, wait for that to come back, and then coordinate with Saskatchewan Blue Cross later. So it's important for you to know who's got the best service for you. So watch for that. There's always gonna be claim forms to fill out. The one thing that delays a claim the most is when clients don't actually complete and sign their claim form and send it in to us. They think, eh, I haven't seen a bill, everything must be good, right? When it's sitting there waiting for your signature and your information. So watch for that. And you're always gonna have a separate consent form from Alberta Healthcare to say, we, you're allowing us to access your records with Alberta Healthcare and also to claim back the amount of money they would pay towards that bill on your behalf. So just watch for that, you'll always have to fill that one out. Lots of times when clients are traveling, they will always say to us, I've got 30 days coverage with my retiree plan, but we want to go for 60 days. So I want to buy 30 days worth of top up from you. So what you're saying is, I've got company A for the first 30 days, and then I want to buy another policy with company B for the next 30 days. And you're saying, I love travel insurance companies so much that I want to deal with two of them, two separate policies, two sets of terms and conditions, two lists of exclusions and whatnot. Are you kidding me? So what can happen here, to give you an example, is you got company A for 30 days, and then you got company B for 30 days. So let's say it's day 25 of your trip, you're not feeling good, you go to the doctor. The doctor gives you some medication and tells you to take it for seven days and then come back and see him. So you take the meds for seven days, it doesn't really do anything, you're not feeling any better, it's now day 32 of your trip and you go back to the doctor. So now the cold is now pneumonia and you need to be hospitalized. Who's gonna pay for the hospitalization? Company A? No, you're outside there 30 days. Company B? No, it's an unstable pre-existing because company B's policy starts on day 31 and it's not gonna cover any condition that wasn't stable in the three months or six months prior to the start of their policy. So do yourselves a favor. If you got coverage for 30 days with company A, go to company A and say, hey, I'd like to extend my coverage and stay longer and buy top up from them. If they won't sell you coverage, or the cost of their top up is ridiculously high, they're trying to tell you something. They're interested in covering the first 30 days of your trip, and they're, because it's the low risk stuff, and they're not interested in being in it with you for the long haul. So they jack the rate so you look elsewhere, right? So if, that, if they're not gonna cover you for the whole time, I'd be looking for a policy that is gonna cover for the whole time. If it's us that you buy, and you get sick in that first 30 days where you've got duplicate coverage, then call us first, because we don't have a limit on our air ambulance, we don't have a limit on our return of the deceased, we'll prepay that stuff for you, and we'll deal with the other company later, okay? One last thing you wanna make sure on this, uh, tr on uh, medical insurance, you wanna make sure you're looking for the automatic extension stuff. Because if you are supposed to return by midnight tonight and your flight doesn't get you back or you're driving home and you're stuck in a snowstorm in Butte, Montana, you want to make sure that you've got additional coverage. So with our policy, you can't return because you're sick, traveling companion is sick, the flight doesn't get you, you're stuck in a snowstorm, your car breaks down, it'll automatically extend for five days. If you're hospitalized on the last day, it goes through the period of hospitalization plus an additional five days. So watch for that so that you know. If you're coming home from Arizona 
and you know it's snowing at home and you think, oh geez, let's stop in Vegas for a week, that's not an automatic extension, but just call us and, and then you just pay for the additional days and uh, away we go. How am I doing on time? I got five minutes, <laughs> okay. See, I talk a lot, as you can tell. As long as it's <laughs> helpful and I'm not getting the hook yet from the front row, I'm good. Um, so cancellation insurance, well, this will be quick. So cancellation talks about the investment you make in your trip, so your tour, your cruise, your airfare. Interruption looks after the unexpected out-of-pocket expenses, so whether you have to come home early because something's happened here, or if it is that you misconnect. So the airline doesn't get you to your destination on time because they had a delay and now you missed your next flight. All of that stuff is included in interruption insurance. So when we talk about trip cancellation, we break it down. There's 33 different reasons that we cover in our policy as to why and what can happen that's causing you to cancel your trip. So whether it's you get sick, your family member gets sick, your traveling companion gets sick, your traveling companion's immediate family gets sick. So it extends to a number of people. So for us, family members include the family tree, so grandparents to grandchildren, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, siblings, in-laws. So the family tree out too, but not including cousins are included. Now, if you're traveling with your cousin, then they become your traveling companion, right? We're just not gonna cover you to cancel because your, your cousin has the flu, because Lord knows you got lots of cousins out there. Um, it could be uh, accommodation and transportation. So it might be that the hotel that you're booked at has had a fire, right? And now it's shut down, so your airfare to get you there is not going to be useful anymore because the hotel is going to reimburse your money that you paid for the hotel because it's no longer there. But it could be that you have to cancel your trip because you had a pipe burst in your basement and now your, your basement's flooded and you want to go, right? Or it could be burglary. And now, of course, you're not going to leave if your house was burgled and you need to deal with the insurance companies and changing the locks and all of that. The other one in the government advisories that we need to watch out for, especially nowadays, because it happens so often, is the government advisories saying Canadians should not travel to Costa Rica due to increased uh, political activity or whatever, right? So if you've got a travel insurance policy in place before the advisory comes out, you can cancel your trip, get your money back, and then book a different vacation to somewhere where you're not going to be dealing with that. Right? So all of those things are important. When we look at interruption, so it could be one of those things. So I'm on my 10-day cruise, and two days in, I get a phone call that my grandmother's not doing well, and I need to come home in a hurry. So I've used two days of the 10-day cruise. My interruption insurance is going to pay me back for the eight days I didn't get to use. They're going to pay for my one-way ticket home, and then they're also going to cover my hotels and whatnot if I have to overnight somewhere to get home. So all of that is out-of-pocket out expenses that are covered by a travel insurance policy. It could be the carrier delay. So let's say we're all going to go on a cruise together, and we're going to go Calgary, Toronto, Miami, and then get on the cruise tomorrow. So we're at the Calgary airport. Now Toronto's in a snowstorm. The flight's not leaving Calgary because it can't land in Toronto. So now we're sitting there. We can wait for the airline to get us to Miami, and if they get us there after the ship is gone, then your benefit is to get you caught up to the ship, plus pay for that day of the cruise that you missed. But you have another opportunity at this point when you're sitting in Calgary and you can't go that way through the airline, you can take control when you've got an insurance policy, you can take control and mosey on over to another carrier, buy a ticket, go Calgary, Dallas, get to Miami tonight, sleep in the hotel you paid for in Miami, get on the ship tomorrow like you were supposed to, all you've done is buy a different plane ticket to bypass the mess in Toronto, submit that with the information as to what happened, and you'll get your money back. And you don't have to be sleeping on the floor of the uh, terminal, you don't have to deal with the lineups of everybody else, and off you go and get on your ship as, as planned. It could be private automobile delay getting you to the airport. So we're on our way to the airport, we're going up Deerfoot, and somebody else is in an accident, now the traffic's at a standstill, and you miss your flight. Our policy is a $2,500 benefit to get you caught up. 
It doesn't give you the benefit to, you know, to go home and cry and say, I can't go on my trip. But once you get to the airport, you now have $2,500 to purchase a ticket. You're reimbursed for cancellation insurance or interruption and then to get caught up. So it's ways in which to make your life easier. When we look at the things that are not covered, of course with cancellation, it's always about the unexpected situations. So if you're coming in to book a trip and you say, geez, my mom's really sick, I need to buy that cancellation insurance in case I can't go. Well, that's like buying the house insurance when the house is already on fire, right? No insurance company is gonna take that risk. So cancellation insurance is always about the unknown situations that come up after you've booked your trip. So when the travel agent is recommending you buy cancellation insurance when you put down your deposit, even if you are not traveling for another year or another 18 months, the insurance policy will look at what did you know the day you bought the policy and was there any reason to believe you couldn't travel as scheduled. So if somebody's booking a river cruise for 18 months from now, what in heaven's name could you know today that's going to prevent you from traveling in June of 2020? Right? So buy your policy now so that you establish the effective date. So if something unexpected comes up in that time period, your insurance policy is in place and you're covered for cancellation. So watch for that. When you book with AMA, we've got a bonus that allows for a cancel for any reason option. So we list 33 reasons that you can cancel your trip. This is an additional bonus to say, okay, so I break up with my boyfriend and I don't want to go on the trip, or the dog gets sick and I can't leave, or you know something that's not listed on there, because no insurance company can identify all of the things that could possibly go wrong and cause you to cancel. We list the most common ones that have happened over, and it's a, a list that has been established for decades. So this is allowing you to say, okay, it's something else, at least you can recover 50% of your money if you couldn't go. Last slide, things to contemplate. So we talk about um, credit cards and cancellation insurance. So lots of times people believe they've got coverage on their credit cards. So I can't stress enough that you need to really do some research with your credit card to find out what exactly is on there. So find out what's covered. What's the common situations? We got 33 different reasons that we'll cover for. Most credit cards might have eight or 10. So if those eight or 10 things are the things that you need to know, then great. Most of them don't cover for loss of employment. Most of them don't cover for damage to the home or an uninhabitable house. So watch for that. Um, you want to find out about specific benefit limits. So when we talked about interruption coverage, so if the flight delays and you misconnect, so let's say we were going to go on a river cruise. So we're going to go Toronto or Calgary, Toronto, then Toronto, Budapest. Well, if we misconnect in Toronto and we have to get there, our policy has a $2,500 benefit to get us caught up. Most credit cards might have $250. So $250 isn't going to get you to Budapest, right? So you need to know what are the limitations on there. You also want to find out what does your credit card mean by immediate family? Usually it's the spouse and cardholder only. Sometimes dependent children, they need to be listed and or they'll sometimes have dependent family members or family members that live in the same household. So my dad lives in Manitoba, he doesn't live with me, so my credit card's not going to do me any good. So watch for that. And then if you're relying on your credit card to pay your medical expenses, I, this is the thing that's the scariest to me, because this is something where it could be $100,000 or $200,000 medical bill. You want to know how is that credit card going to handle that. So I've got a credit card, it's actually a charge card that I've had for years. And every month in the statement, now by email, I get something that says, you're fully covered, no need to buy extra insurance and so on. So I phone them up and I ask them questions. Now I'm the first one to say I know more about the stuff than the person on the other end of the line, so I was annoying to her. But I said to her, do I have travel insurance? And she said, yes you do. So if that's the end of my conversation, I think, okay, I'm good. So I asked a few more questions. Do I have medical insurance? No, you don't, but you could buy it. So when they say, yes, you've got travel insurance, you usually have air flight accident or baggage insurance. So that's their way of saying, yes, you have it. So we look at, uh, so then I said, okay, so um, if I buy medical insurance from you, can you tell me how the claim works? And they said, sure. The first thing is we're gonna use your card to pay the bill. Now this charge card doesn't have a limit on it. 
I have to pay it at the end of every month, and if I don't pay it, it's 30% interest charge, right? So I had it so that all I put on there was things I paid at the end of the month. So anyway, I'm having heart palpitations now because I'm thinking it's a car accident. It's $100,000 that they're slapping on this card, right? I don't have a trust fund that's going to pay that at the end of the month. So then I said to her, okay, so how long does it take to pay the claim? And she said, well, first of all, you need to send your bills to your provincial health plan. Well, we all know how long that takes, right? So six months later, so then I said, okay, so how long, because I'm asking her, how long is that going to take? She goes, I don't know, a couple of weeks, I think. Really? So then she puts me on hold again. I'm sure calls me bad names. Comes back again and says, oh, sorry, I guess it's 20-some weeks. Okay, so at least five months is going to go by before you're going to pay my claim. So then I said, who's going to pay the interest charges on this balance that I've not been able to pay? And she's like, well, the interest charges are always the responsibility of the cardholder, ma'am. So more heart palpitations, right? And then she says, yeah, but look at all the points you're going to get. <laughs> I'm broke. I can't travel, but I got points. <laughs> and my health is not, because I've had heart palpitations, I'm done. I am toast. Okay, so was this helpful tonight? Was it helpful to make sure? Okay, so I've got time for questions unless I'm getting the hook. I've given you, that, if you've got a pen, you can write down, that's my email address, that's my cell phone number. So if you are, um, if you get home and you think, geez, I should have asked this question, or I wonder how this works, or whatever, you feel free to um, send me an email or give me a call, and I'm always happy to, to answer any questions. And again, I'm never going to be the one to say that I'm an expert on this stuff, but I've had lots of experience, so I can give you sort of ideas of what you might ask. Question. Yeah, you've done a great job, and you've done, you're also acting as a salesman for AMA. <laughs> um, and you promoted your policy very well. Are there downsides to your policies other than potentially higher premiums? So, we, yeah, our goal is to cover as many of our members and customers as possible. So we do have six eligibility questions on ours, and they're listed on the front of our medical questionnaire. So you'll see right underneath the stop sign, those eligibility ones say that we're not going to sell you a policy at all if any of those things apply to you. So you can't be traveling contrary to medical advice, you can't be on kidney dialysis, no organ transplants, you can't have a terminal illness with less than six months to live, no treatment for metastatic cancer in the last five years and no home oxygen for a lung condition. So that in, in, in saying that, that eliminates the really high risk ones so that we can cover more of our traveling population. Our goal is always to be middle of the marketplace from a price perspective. We're never going to be the cheapest and we're not going to be the most expensive. So one of our downfalls could be that we're a little bit higher than what other people have but we also have deductible options that can bring down those rates. So from a, what don't we cover, that could be a detriment versus what others do, we don't have currently, and this is something changing in March, we don't currently have the option to buy down the stability period like other policies do. So there are ones out there that could say to you, if you pay an additional premium of X amount of dollars or X percentage of your premium, you can buy your stability period from three months or six months down to seven days. So, and, and that we're changing and having that opportunity in March to do that. So for me, that's our biggest detriment right now is we don't have that option. Okay, you had a question? Yes. Um, how, uh, what's the latest time prior to, um, prior to the part say, to buy the cancellation insurance? Cancellation insurance, you want to buy it when you make your booking. So whenever you put down your deposit, you want to buy cancellation insurance. If you put your deposit down two months ago and you're traveling next week, we're not going to take that risk from you, right? Because why didn't you buy it two months ago? You're leaving in a week and now you want cancellation insurance? that's going to throw off a red flag. We'll always sell you interruption insurance, so to cover those emergency expenses, to get caught up to your trip or to come home, so the one-way ticket home would be covered, but we're not going to take on the risk of canceling your $3,000 tour that you booked six months ago and you're leaving in a week. So we're not going to do that. 
if of course, and how, the rule of thumb for us is if there is more time between today when you want to buy the cancellation policy and when you want to travel versus today and when you booked, we're probably going to sell you a cancellation policy. You just need to come in and ask us. Okay, now in one case here, now we didn't cancel, but uh, quite a few people canceled. We booked a cruise ship, uh, cruise uh, ship um, with uh, would have been one year in advance. Yeah. We signed on to that. Yeah. And uh, we had until six days before departure to buy a cancellation insurance policy. Yeah. So a lot of times people will buy because will allow to do that because you could probably cancel up until the sixty days and get all your money back. Yeah. So they'll allow you to buy it at final payment. We're going to sell that to you as well at that time because you're under no penalty really at that point. When I'm saying that you want to buy the insurance when you book your trip, regardless if you've got a year before that becomes non-refundable, is because now you know what's going on today. So buy it today because you know there's no reason. If you have to cancel that trip before you make the final payment and you get all your money back, then your insurance policy is refundable as well. So you're giving us the money and we're establishing, yeah, we're gonna cover you here. And if you book with AMA Travel, we're gonna give you that cancel for any reason option as well. So it's a win-win. You're just putting out your money ahead of time so that you can establish when's your effective date. Because if between now and then, it, you could come up with all kinds of situations that now are either unstable, may reason for you not to travel, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I don't know. For those of us in this room who have metastatic prostate cancer and will be on treatment for yeah. ever, yeah. What, are, what are our options? So we're not going to sell, if you've meta, got metastatic cancer in the last five years, that's one of our eligibility, so we're not going to cover you. Your option then, though, is to look for a company, and there are some out there that don't have metastatic cancer as an eligibility rule. So there are some out there. Um, what I'm always going to suggest you do is simply go to the Google and type in travel insurance coverage for metastatic cancer. Now, they may sell you a policy that covers everything but the metastatic cancer. So it's like that exclusion on the right hand side. So you're going to take the risk if something goes wrong with the cancer, they're going to take the risk if it's a heart attack, a car accident, et cetera, et cetera. AMA, it's we just will not cover you for that. And it's only if, it's, if the cancer has metastasized and been treated in that time period. If it's not metastasized, you're still in the eligibility. You continue filling out the questionnaire if you're over 55 or buy a package policy that has medical in there. It's the metastatic for us that puts it into that high risk category and then takes it off the table. Okay, I have okay. a question related to a cruise. Yeah. Cruise line says, uh, your, your deposit, or your payment, well, say initially the deposit, is totally refundable yeah. up to 120 days before the cruise. Right. So you get your money back if you have to cancel it. Should they take the coverage at the day you take the booking, or yeah. does it matter they can wait because I will get my money back? I, w I always suggest, in 27 years worth, I always suggest buy it at the time that you make the booking. Because what the insurance policy is looking at is saying, what did you know that date that might prevent you from traveling a year from now? And if you didn't know of anything at that point, then everything is an unknown situation that comes up. And if you cancel in that time period between your deposit and the 120 days prior, you're going to get your insurance premium back but you've established your effective date, so I didn't know that my aunt was gonna get sick, right? I didn't know that I was gonna be diagnosed with diabetes or whatever. Okay. My supplementary question goes this way. Um, a lot of people, Alberta Medicare, right? Yeah. Uh, everybody, Alberta Medicare. Um, and a lot of people have Blue Cross. Yeah. As supplementary. Right. Uh, they say, I got Blue Cross coverage. Right. So, Does Blue Cross cover you outside of Alberta? No. Does Blue Cross cover you for international? No. Does Blue Cross cover you right. to take travel insurance and quote in cancellation insurance? Right. No. no. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Speaking as an insurance professional rather than an AMA representative. Yep. 
on the internet, are there any good sites that compare the coverage of different carriers? For example, on credit cards, there are sites that you can yeah. you know, compare the benefits that uh, you get. Right. Because it seems like this is a very complex area, yeah. and you know, there's a lot of carriers, huh? and, and they have different coverages. And you know, we, we, could, we could all try to be 27-year uh, insurance right. professionals, but we're not, you're not going to become that. But is there a quick and hopefully not too dirty way to compare? Um, there is one for credit cards, and it's called insurei.com, and it's insure with an E-Y-E dot com. So you can look there and pull up your credit card and just make sure you hover over any check marks and it gives you some more information. But you're always going to be best to call them for details. But the only ones I've ever seen for comparing, it's always just about comparing rates. It doesn't actually compare the products with, like there's that Kinetics is one that compares rates of different travel insurance policies. So K-I-N-E-T-I-X is the one from that. But I see that it usually is just about rates. It doesn't go into, and you'd have to then go and do your research on that stuff. So you're right, it's a complex situation, a complex topic, and there isn't one quick and dirty way to find the differences. So not that I found it anyway. You. You're welcome. Uh, well, um, in terms of follow up on the question of that standard, yeah, prostate cancer, uh, while some of us have can prostate cancer, we know it's micrometastatic. It hasn't been detected on any radiographic basis. Okay. So what does that really mean? What does, your do what does your medical records indicate? Does it say that it has metastasized? If you've had CT and bone scans with current technology, it would say it has It doesn't appear to show. But what the doctors would say, it's mi micrometastatic, but we don't have sophistication yet to diagnose the metastasis and where it is. What does that mean for insurance? Well, f so again, the insurance policy is always just going to go based on what your medical records indicate. And so I'm always going to say you're going to, you need to ask that question to each provider because they might all be different. So I would ask that question to them. And I wouldn't just ask the person who's selling the policy. I would be asking the underwriter. I'd have, I'd request it. So if you want to send me an email, if you wrote down my email, if you want to send that to me, I'll send it to our, our medical personnel at Orion and say, hey, what do we, how do we answer this question? Because I'm not equipped to answer that if question. If I can ask you one more question. Yeah. How, what's your, very quickly, what's your experience, like in terms of my benefits program through my pension plan, I have five or 10 million lifetime travel accident insurance. What's your experience with those types of policies? So in your life program. So again, what you want to watch out for is if you've got five or ten million dollars lifetime, then that's great. If you've got a half a million lifetime, then I'd be a bit concerned about that because one three hundred thousand dollar travel insurance policy or claim at destination can wipe a good chunk of your lifetime benefits out, and then you'd be out for your medical, your dental, your whatnot. But they don't ask you any questions, and they don't. Say it's usually just a big group policy. So because it's such a giant group policy, they may not have, they may not have pre-existing exclusions and whatnot in there, but you need to ask. They're, they're all very good at saying you got $5 million coverage, but then if you, if you don't get the policy to dig down and say, okay, I got $5 million coverage, but do I have a limit on my air ambulance? Do I have a limit on this? Are you gonna pay that first? So on that handout that I gave you, um, this little blue box on the third page, gives you those things that I sort of talked about. Is this pre-existing stability? Do they prepay? Is there a limit on the air ambulance? Those are some starting questions for you to ask them so that you know, are they gonna pay, uh, pay that up front for you or not? So I'd start with those ones. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I can talk on and on and on about this stuff as you know.